Let's take a trip back to 1991, the year that the web was initially released to the public. The first web page was published in 91, and like any proper historical artifact, it's since been skillfully reconstructed and presented online today in preserved form. Now last year you may have heard of the 25th anniversary of the web. Uh, the journalists got it wrong. There were some pieces in place earlier than this, but if we go back to when the web was initially available to the public, that date would be August 23rd, 1991, so it's not quite 25 years old yet. To put this in some historical context, here's a couple of other notable events that happened that same year. This is the year of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and thus the end of the Cold War. Of course, mankind is not happy unless in some conflict, so this was also the year of the start of the first Gulf War. 1991 was a great, game, great year for video games, as it saw the release of Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Genesis. It was also the year that Street Fighter II was first released to arcades, and it was the same year that a console that's near and dear to my heart, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, was first released. In 1991, mankind was aware of zero exoplanets, that is, planets outside of our solar system. Currently, that number is almost at 2,000, and that includes some planets that reside within their star's habitable zones, otherwise known as prime candidates for life. It's hard to believe that Nirvana's Nevermind was released 25 years ago almost, and the baby on the cover is all grown up today. This is the same year that Linux was first released to the public, and in 1991, we lost one of the good ones. Theodore Geisel died. You might know him better as Dr. Zeus. So the web was launched 24 years ago, and if you map that out to a human lifespan, the web would have had its first day of school 18 years ago. It would have started driving eight years ago. And if you're here in Germany, the web would have had its first drink six years ago, a little bit longer in my part of the world. Chances are that the web is actually older than some of you in this room right now today. There's this quote from Douglas Adams that I find is particularly appropriate and I really relate to for my career. He says that anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. Now, I wasn't there at the beginning. I was too young and way too busy playing Super Nintendo at that time. The web was, however, invented in my lifetime, and I find that I've found that this quote has essentially guided my career so far. I work in this new, exciting medium that has revolutionized the world. I'm, of course, a little bit scared about what gets invented in the next couple of years. I think the tipping point for me may have already come and gone in the form of Google Glass. Now, I haven't met a lot of you, and this is the part where I'd probably do audience participation if I were into that sort of thing, but I think I know something about all of you anyway. A good percentage of you have probably started your professional careers in the last 10 years. If I had to take a guess about how many of you were already working on the web in 2005 in a professional capacity, it would be about 25%. And if you don't believe me, ask three other people after this presentation and find out if I'm right. The truth is that despite the age of the web, those of us who build for it are a relatively young industry. And if we expand that 10-year time frame to between 15 and 20 years, which is an important number for me because that's how long I've been doing it, it's going to be a much smaller value. So 17 years is how long my career on the web has been. I didn't see all of it, but I've been there for an awful lot of it. And I regularly find myself having these conversations in the office where I have to stop and you know, not be the guy who says, back in my day. But because we are a young industry, we sometimes don't know why things are that, the way they are. We no longer see the long and complicated backstory that's led to some of the tricks and techniques that we use or which browser that we no longer care about they were ever necessary to work around in the first place like a spotty version of a historical site within the Internet Archive and all of the broken layout and missing images that that implies, it sometimes seems like our collective memory of our own history is full of holes. And it seems really ironic, especially since we work in a medium that's essentially 
promising to organize the world's information, but we've forgotten pieces of our past. Information is getting lost because links rot and the references fade and we just don't know how things arrived in the place that we're in. And researching this talk has actually shown me how inaccessible some of our recent history is. So we're gonna have to work harder if we wanna hold on to all of that. So what I'd like to do today is help change that a little bit and talk about our past. I wanna spend some time learning from mistakes that we made and try and um, prevent doing that again. So I'm not here today to give you the complete history. I obviously um, can't, it's way too huge. But I can tell you what I've seen. And what I've seen is that the way that we design and build for the web has ch changed dramatically, even during the time that I've done it. The work that I do now is about as similar to the work that I do in 1998 as, say, a Formula One car would be to a Model T. Now, if you've read my bio and, and heard Mark's introduction, you obviously know that standards-based design is where I focus large parts of my career. So that's the lens that we're going to be viewing today's history lesson through. With that, let's dive in. So I'm going to break this talk down into three major time periods, and each one has its own character and its own challenges that we had to work with during that period. I'm going to be honest here. I'm grouping these according to convenient narrative structure, not necessarily accurate historical uh, uh, relevance. I would imagine that a real historian would probably take this first 10-year period and break it down much more finely than I've done, but we haven't formally defined this stuff, so I get to take some liberties because it makes it easier to talk about. So obviously this first 10 years is a very important era for our industry. This is the time period of the invention of the web. This is when the browser wars happened. This is when most of the dot-com boom took place. It was an extremely experimental time. Nobody knew what the web was capable of. Nobody knew what the web was even. And because we didn't understand its limits, it was capable of absolutely everything. Yes, that is actually Microsoft's first website. Uh, no, I have no idea what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so let's take a look at some significant milestones during this period, and we'll dig into a couple of these in a little bit more detail. In 1993, the Mosaic browser launched, and this was a revolutionary browser because it was really the first important consumer-facing browser. It was also the first browser that supported inline images within your web pages. Prior to this, much of the web was text only. So it's also worth noting that uh, 1993 was the year that CERN, the research facility where the web was invented, uh, was the year that they devoted the web to the public good. Anybody, anywhere could use the web without fee. And that openness is directly responsible for the ubiqu ubiquity of the web today. In 1994, of course, the W3C formed, and we all know this as the guiding organization that helps define and shape the web. Uh, 1994 is also interesting because it was the same year that the original founders of Mosaic went on to form another company, a company called Netscape you may have heard of, and in 1995, that company went public for its first time. Its initial public offering was essentially the defining moment that kicked off the entire dot-com boom. Before 1996, CSS didn't exist. It was released in 96, but browsers really didn't support it all that well. The development of CSS happened very slowly, and I think that's historically interesting because by 1997, we were really in the full swing of the browser wars. Support for new and exciting features at that time was seen as a competitive advantage for these browsers, so CSS, by all rights, should have been supported early on. But instead, the browsers seemed to be content to get a leg up on their competition by supporting a lot more proprietary features and building their own versions. So really, the browser war started in about 1995, and this was a time uh, when the web was starting to become popular in the public consciousness, the media was talking about it more, but probably more importantly, 1995 was the year that Microsoft licensed Mosaic to produce its initial browser, Internet Explorer 1.0. And that's when the browser wars really started. So covering these events in years does not do them justice. Uh, months or even weeks might be a better time frame because the market shares were changing just so fast and the browser versions were being updated so frequently, but it's safe to say that by 1997 we were really in the middle of this. Then in 1998, the Web Standards Project launched, and this was an effort from a group of developers who were trying to make sense of this whole cross-browser development nightmare. Um, the competition of these browsers had created a lot of feature divergence, and those of us building for the web were just kind of we had to say enough is enough, and so this project started. Now, what's interesting about what the Web Standards Project, it was actually designed to be, um, the name of it was 
WASP. And I reached out to Jeffrey Zeldman and asked him, so where did the term web standards come from? And he said, well, we wanted the term WASP because it was to signify a group of developers where you could ignore one, but if you've got an angry swarm of them buzzing around you, they're a lot harder to ignore. So the sting was the entire message, but in a happy accident, the term web standards was kind of a backronym that was ported to make sense of that term WASP, and so that was probably the more meaningful legacy of this project. The Web Standards Project, of course, did a lot of important things, one of them being the browser upgrade campaign that you may have seen, and this was designed to help change developer mindset. Uh, it was, the entire point of it was to put a banner on your site saying, listen, you're using an older browser, please go here to download a, a more recent version of whatever, we don't care, we just want you to be on a modern browser. The point was not to convince users to upgrade their browsers. The point was actually to give developers an out so that they could experiment with new technology, with standards-based design, and not have to worry about supporting these legacy browsers. In 1999, uh, Microsoft finally hit the top spot in the marketplace, and that's really notable because it only took them just over three years to do that. They used their Windows monopoly in order to push Internet Explorer on the world, and that was a lead that they held for 13 years until Chrome finally overtook them in 2012. Now, as a footnote, Netscape was sold to AOL the same year and continued on developing their browser and then continued on on life support until Netscape was officially shut down in uh, the mid-2000s. Now, it's extremely hard to replicate the early web today. You have to remember that what was being displayed was being displayed on cathode ray tubes, CRT monitors, gigantic boxy things that had extremely low resolution. And if you think mobile screens are cramped, well, that 640 by 40 resolution that we had to deal with, that was also taken up by operating system toolbars and browser Chrome. So we had very little effective space to actually put our designs within. So let's take a fairly iconic site and go back in time. This is what Yahoo looked like in 1994. This was a simpler time. <laughs> now, by this point, you were probably running a browser on Windows. Uh, that was definitely the most common operating system. Typically, you had a gray background to your site because the ability to change that to another color hadn't actually been invented yet. Now, this screenshot obviously distorts the truth in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, it's way too big. This is a much more modern browser. Uh, the original size probably would have been about as wide as the toolbar up top. And the type is rendered much uh, in much higher fidelity than would have been at the time. We didn't have anti-alias type back then. We had 12 pixel high type that was quite pixelated, but of course it didn't matter as much because our CRT monitors made it super fuzzy anyway. <laughs> 1995, this is what Yahoo looked like. Obviously, major uh, companies were still experimenting with their brands quite frequently here. Um, this is a, probably a more typical browser size. By 1996, they'd settled down a little bit. By 1997, they had launched this, and to me, and probably anybody who was using the web in that era, this remains a fairly iconic design because this design remained the Yahoo homepage for a lot of years. It was around for about four, maybe even five years. And that's significant because this was a time where we talked about the concept of internet years, where what happened on the web was happening much quicker than outside in the regular sphere. So for three or four human years, uh, for the one design to be consistent on the web, that just seemed like it, it was there for ages. Didn't change much by 1999. By 2000, well, we're starting to see some of the clutter that we'd expect today. And just for reference, Yahoo's come a long way since then. So a history of web design would not be complete without mentioning some very uh, influential landmark sites. And the first one of these, if uh, you see Jeff Bean walking around uh, later, you can talk to him about it in much more detail than I could possibly give you. But Hotwired was a project that he was involved with. Now, this was Wired Magazine's online offering, and it was significant because they produced multiple different properties. This is where some really influential early websites that we still talk about today came from. Suck.com, WebMonkey, Hotwired, and at least a couple dozen more. But most famously, or perhaps infamously, uh, Hotwired was responsible for the first banner ad on the web. This was so new at the time and so such a curiosity that click-throughs were around 80%. And if you compare that today to today, when you have an extremely well-targeted ad, you're lucky to get 1%. And we don't even measure click-through rates anymore. We don't care about people who actually engage. We care about how many impressions you're making and the cost per thousand of those. So 
Today's web that's extremely happy to, experience, uh, to sacrifice user experience for the sake of advertising, all of these full screen blocking ads that have a countdown timer until you can continue on to the site that you came there to view in the first place, or uh, modal pop-ups nagging you to subscribe to their newsletter, those advertising techniques can all be traced back to these 27,000 pixels. So, Search before Google, we had Alta Vista, which I preferred because it had the distinct advantage of being just slightly better than the others at the time, sites like Lycos and Excite. Webmail before Gmail came along, we had Hotmail. Now, it's actually really interesting to note that Gmail's been around for 10 years now, and when they first launched, their promise was to give everybody a one gigabyte mailbox. One gigabyte of online storage was just like an insane luxury at that time because we were used to all of the other webmail services and their 25 meg max. I don't know what Hotmail launched with. I would imagine it's probably in the hundreds of kilobytes. Now, GeoCities was the wild west for the personal side of the web. It wasn't the first place to host your site, but it was definitely the most popular. It was actually the third largest site on the web at one point. And you got this weird eclectic mix of randomness which really helped define the time period. Uh, it's also notice, notable for being acquired by Yahoo and then shut down quite a few years later, and thus we lost about 40 million pages of early web history. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But I want to change gears for now and talk about how the web was received. The web was cre created for document structure. Keep in mind that Tim Berners-Lee was working for CERN at the time, which is a scientific research facility. It was a science project. It was designed for information organization and to organize scientific documentation. But the web, as it was so famously captured in uh, the London Olympics, was given to everyone to use. And it turns out that the best practices for computer scientists are not necessarily the same for regular people. The early web was designed for structure, and there's a lot of benefits to the structural approach. Um, you get machine readability, which leads to better accessibility uh, better indexing and search engines, uh, portability to all devices. These were all primary concepts of the web of 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, there were guiding principles. However, that structural purity, that wasn't what we were destined for. There was this phrase that was repeated very often by anybody who understood what the web was meant to be, that the web is not print. Get it through your heads, designers. The web is not the same as designing for the printed page. It's a different medium, except that everybody wanted it to be print, at least at first, because that's what they knew. You can't just give somebody a brand new medium and then expect them to get it right away or to use it to its full potential. Until they know better, they can only relate to it in terms of what they've seen before. And usually that means duplicating previous mediums in a new space. The CD-ROM aesthetic was particularly popular in the mid-90s. Now, as we heard yesterday, this happens in other mediums, radio being a prime example of that. Early radio shows were simply stage plays or broadcasts of the uh, written word that were being read out. There wasn't any original originality in that medium until people actually figured out what it was good for. So it turns out that Marshall McLuhan's quote, the medium is the message, it's very, very true, especially when it comes to brand new mediums. So the everyone, that Tim Berners-Lee had given the web to had voted. We wanted more than structure. We wanted the web to be a visual medium. People wanted pretty sites and animated GIFs and places to post their cat photos or bird photos. Now, the browsers didn't help there. Um, catering to normal people was seen as a competitive advantage because there's a lot more normal people than there are computer scientists. And the race during the browser wars to imp was to implement more and more visual controls, and it really didn't matter how they got there. The only way to achieve this visual nature was to abuse HTML structure at the time, hence font tags and inline formatting. The mid-90s HTML was all about presentation. Designers came from print. That's what we were taught. You know, we wanted pixel-perfect versions of our design work because that's how we related to this new medium. We didn't care how we got it. This book, Creating Killer Websites, was a, a revolution. And it was so popular because it helped people achieve that. It got people excited about the web. But like any important revolution, it did some good and some harm simultaneously. This is where we got the single pixel GIF used to 
prop open tables and create padding and margins and white space, completely destroying any concern for structure or accessibility or portability, basically undoing all of that early semantic work that the W3C had initiated. That was not the worst of it. No, no. Because at the time, people would build entirely textual, information-heavy sites with Flash just for the sake of a custom scroll bar that they could control or style. They would save out an entire site as an image and then create links using image maps, thus rendering it completely inaccessible. And there was a reason for this. First of all, you didn't have to worry about browser compatibility. That was just not an issue anymore, which was a very, very strong point in its favor at the time. As well, you could faithfully replicate your design using the visual layout tools that you would normally use to design with. You didn't have to code. That was a super compelling uh, argument for some people. You could do things that you couldn't otherwise do in the browser, like have custom fonts and drop shadows and fancy effects like that. Now, CSS was designed to fix some of this, except it just it wasn't powerful enough at the time. It was good for things like fonts and colors and removing underlines from your links. But that was really it for six or seven years. I personally learned CSS in 98 to do things like this. But I didn't build my, full, my first full CSS layout until probably like late 2002, many years later. But it's interesting to think about this in hindsight, because I wonder if we had to go through that phase. You know, the, the web was a playground at the time. Would you be interested in playing in a fully structured, fully ordered, you must do this kind of playground? Or do you want something that's a little bit more open-ended and anything goes and you can explore any particular area that you want? So structure is just not appealing to the general public. A visual web was something that actually captured their imagination. So we've reached the end of this first time period. Uh, this is a graph of what the NASDAQ looked like. This is the index that tracks uh, high-tech companies uh, during most of this period. And this is interesting because I started my career right about here, which was fantastic timing because things started going horribly wrong right about here. It all came crashing down in 2000. So before we get to this, I'm going to grab some water. I like to think of this next period, this next five years, as the years of the independent. There wasn't a lot of money in the industry. There wasn't a lot of money being thrown toward the web because there was a common sentiment at the time that the web was over. Big companies were pulling out and not investing in it anymore. And the people that held on and con continued contributing during this time were individuals and small companies. And they did work at that stage of the web's evolution that shaped it, and I think we can still see traces of today. This is the era that I think really has helped define my own career, and it's the, area, the era that I think I can talk about with a little bit of authority. Things felt small during this time period, but in a comfortable way. There was a lot more community happening. You could read a couple of dozen design blogs and be pretty sure that you were getting all the news on the latest. Blog comments were even a viable idea. You didn't have to moderate them. People were nice to each other. We didn't have comment spam. It was amazing. Blogging was really important to web design, and it's, it's kind of easy to forget this now. Uh, the community was largely thanks to these personal sites because we didn't have Twitter or Facebook. We didn't have you know, Tumblr or Medium, which came along a lot later. We just had movable type, eventually WordPress. So our community necessarily lived at these self-hosted sites, and this was the only way to make your ideas visible, aside from potentially publishing on a list apart. There's a lot of great discussion that happened on these blogs. There's some debate that happened in the comments. And it was this back and forth, this discourse, that really helped us uh, come up with new ideas and refine our existing ones. It was a really exciting time of a lot of collaboration. And I don't really see anything that exists quite like this anymore. Twitter, well, it's too brief for any sort of nuanced conversation. Medium, super one-sided. You know, you can broadcast, but you, you can't have that debate. Maybe what's happening on Slack is the closest that we could see, but obviously that's very private and controlled, and you're not broadcasting to the general public. So a couple of important events during this time period. Can you imagine a world without Wikipedia? That was the world that we lived in prior to 2000. In fact, at this time, Google barely even existed. They had officially launched in 98, but it was only around 2000 that they really started uh, uh, hitting the general public's perception and um, really hitting their stride as the service that they are now. So this is a world when Google and Wikipedia were brand new. 
In 2002, we got some of our first CSS hacks. Uh, I, I'm not actually historically sure which one was first, but I believe it may have been Tontic Chelix box model hack. Regardless of which one was first, that was the most important one. Now, you probably these days are well aware of the CSS uh, box sizing property and the border box value. And this is a super useful way of initializing a new site because you don't have to do the tedious calculations of your padding and your widths together. Right? I see a couple nodding heads. Yep. Okay. So back in those days, you only had it the other way. You had to do all that tedious math. And uh, okay, that worked, except for Internet Explorer, because of course the most popular browser on the market would get something so fundamental wrong. So you could literally target a browser that did it that way or a browser that didn't, but you couldn't target both, and that rendered CSS layouts completely unfeasible. The box model hack was the only way that we were able to resolve this impasse and move along. It exploited a parsing bug in Internet Explorer, and it allowed you to serve slightly different style to that browser. Now, we went too far with hacks. Hacks started taking on a life of their own and becoming a thing where we were trying to hack browsers just for the sake of being able to uh, selectively, selectively give style to one specific browser. Very similar to what we were doing with user agent sniffing, but it wasn't user agent sniffing, so it was somehow okay, except it really wasn't. <laughs> but it's really easy to remember that, or to forget, that back at that point in time, we needed that early hack, the box model hack, in order to be able to consider CSS at all. Okay, in 2003, the CSS Zen Garden launched. So this was my contribution, and I obviously cannot talk about it objectively, uh, but I think this site deserves a mention because it was very important for uh, moving the web forward. I built the site out of frustration, actually. Um, I really loved the potential of standards-based design at the time, but nobody was using it but I really wanted to. And I was working in a job at the time where I wasn't able to uh, play around with these new technologies and these new capabilities because I was stuck doing it the old way. Now, Jeffrey Zeldman had the saying at the time, show people the value of standards, don't tell them. And that really resonated with me. And I took that to heart and I said, you know, what would be more powerful than showing people what um, a single HTML file can do with hundreds and hundreds of different designs. I didn't know that it would take on a life of its own and become as big as it was. I was just trying to solve that simple, um, uh, basic problem of showing people what CSS is capable of already. It's, it's built into the language. I didn't invent anything. I was just an advertising person. I was telling you about it, which is ironic because I don't really trust marketers all that much. So, uh, 2004, we saw the launch of Firefox. Now, this is interesting because um, Netscape, the browser, open sourced prior to the collapse of the company, which led directly to the Mozilla browser, or the suite, actually. It was an email program, um, a news, news group reader, a few other things like that. Firefox came along to just strip down all of that bloat and just produce a very quick, fast browser. Uh, this was also the same year as the formation of the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, also known as What WG. You might know of them from such things as HTML5. In 2005, Adobe uh, decided to buy Macromedia, and instead of having two companies that were competing to create great design and authoring tools, well, we ended up with just one. And that company's focus was not actually the open web. It was PDF and Flash and Air for many years. So the state of our actual authoring tools really didn't evolve during this time. Uh, aside from getting new visual features, but nothing that really related to the web. I really like what's happening with Sketch. It's an independent team that's producing something and actually giving Adobe something to compete against, and I think that's fantastic, and I'd love to see more of that happening. So, some of the influential sites during this time period. Well, we have a list apart. Um, you can almost trace your career progression back to which design you remember being current. I remember that neon one up in the top left. A list apart has been around uh, for 18 years or more now. They started publishing as a mailing list and didn't actually have a website until quite a few years later. Uh, but people forget that there was actually another one at the time, Digital Web Magazine. Digital Web ran for about nine years before shutting down in 2009. And both of these places were uh, publishing new articles fairly regularly, and they were sites where we could go and get visibility to our ideas beyond just our blogs and promote things and concepts and techniques to a wider audience. So they were also very instrumental in helping define the community at that point. 
Now, the launch of Wired News was a really big deal. This was done by uh, Douglas Bowman and a small team at Wired. Uh, this was important because it was the first site with a full CSS layout. Now, you guys might remember a couple years ago when Microsoft went responsive, that was seen as a very big win for responsive web design. Wired News was essentially our Microsoft at the time. Wired was a huge deal. And at that point in time, it was actually a very brave step for them to take because unlike responsive, our fallbacks were ugly. And I don't mean, you know, ugly in that you had to do a lot to make them work. I mean that the fallback sites were actually quite ugly. You had to go all in with CSS. So it was a very hard barrier to get past. ESPN um, came along a little while later, and it was important for the same reasons. Uh, this was done by uh, Mike Davidson and his team. And what's interesting is that Mike and uh, Douglas are now both at Twitter. So, uh, or Douglas was at Twitter. I'm not sure why there's a Twitter connection to early CSS sites, but it was kind of interesting. Um, ESPN was important because it was the first consumer-facing site to launch with a full standards-based design. When Wired News launched, uh, there was still a bit of a tendency to say, hey, yeah, that's great, but Wired has a very tech-savvy audience, so they can get away with doing that. We're talking to end users, you know, people who aren't tech-savvy at all, so we could never consider that. When ESPN came along, that really just kind of helped seal the deal on that argument. Um, it's hard to see why that's important in hindsight because standards obviously won out in the end and we're all using them today uh, and we don't have to talk about it anymore, but these were major, major breakthroughs. Now these breakthroughs came at a time when our browser development had stalled. We had not one, but two boat anchor browsers that prevented us from moving forward for many years. The update cycles of these browsers had gone from uh, weeks to years. There was no such thing as browser auto-update at the time. The biggest problem was that Netscape 4 was still around at the start of this time period. It was released in 1997 originally, the version 4.0 that is, and it still had significant market share over six years later. Netscape itself, it was certainly part of the problem. They took forever to launch the next version. In fact, they took so long, they skipped Netscape 5 and went directly to 6 for some reason. Um, it, they took so long that the company got bought out and eventually just destroyed themselves from the inside. At least we got Firefox out of that. But I would say that, you know, a lot of you have probably had experience debugging for Internet Explorer 6. Netscape 4 was worse. It was far worse. I would rather support a million Internet Explorer 6s than a single Netscape 4. It was that bad. Some, some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so Netscape 4 had to go away before standards-based design could become practical. This is what the Web Standards Project's browser upgrade campaign helped achieve. What do you think when you see a graph like this? If you're a business major, you look at this and you go, that's fantastic, that company should be applauded. Almost 100% market share, I wanna work for them. Um, well, except, <laughs> that was Internet Explorer's market share. Um, Netscape 4 had, sell, had set up this slow update legacy, and then Internet Explorer 6 perpetuated that on for many years, and we had at least 10 years of slowdown where we just couldn't do anything new, really. I suspect that's a lot of the reason why we're seeing a lot of uh, change happening today. Once these boat anchor browsers disappeared and browsers started auto-updating, the possibilities have really exploded. I would say that we would be years ahead of where we are right now if it weren't for Netscape 4 and Internet Explorer 6. So this was a time, the 2001 to 2006 time period, this was a time where it felt like Internet Explorer had essentially locked up the web. They'd risen to over 90% market share, and they'd done this thanks to a fun idea called bundling that led to a fun idea called antitrust lawsuits from Microsoft, so I guess no good deed goes unpunished. But they did all of this to control the market and, what, shape the web however they wanted, right? That's what you would do if you had that market share. They didn't do that at all. They stopped updating their browser. With that kind of market share, they could do anything, and they chose to walk away from the web. And it was very hard for us who were actually building websites at the time not to do that extremely cynically. There were a lot of theories on the outside, because Microsoft wasn't communicating with the community the way that they do these days. There were a lot of theories about what was happening. You know, it looked like they'd seen the web as competition to their primary platform, and they'd used their operating system monopoly to take over it, and then stop developing it to let it die. And it's an elegant theory because hindsight says that it's probably right. Of course, an ever-connected network of computers makes any single device or operating system irrelevant. 
Now, Microsoft's problem is that they went for the web alone. They didn't predict mobile technology. They didn't predict the cloud or all of these you know, online services that we're designing for that really have cemented that you know, um, obsolescence of a single operating system and created an ecosystem of devices. So Microsoft's um, been struggling lately because they focused on just this one aspect of it. Now, us web developers, well, <laughs> we had to press on anyway. And all we could see is that there were no browser updates coming and there was no word at all from Microsoft about the future of Internet Explorer. So it didn't really matter what the other browsers did. We could really only use as much as Microsoft had implemented, which meant that CSS2, well, it was pretty buggy and that wasn't gonna change anytime soon. CSS3, lots of cool stuff in there. That's so far off that it, we may as well not even talk about it. The browsers were one thing, but the knowledge wasn't really there either. Nobody could really knew what CSS could do beyond fonts and colors. There weren't a lot of people who could build full, build full CSS layouts, and those who could could rarely get the, um, sorry, those who could were probably not designers, and so they were building layouts that were perceived as boxy and boring and not very interesting, and so there was this perception that all CSS would allow would be boring websites. There was also a problem of selling standards to your boss. I mentioned this earlier. There were so many blog posts that were asking how to do that at the time. It was a big problem because no one really wanted to be the first mover here. We could all see the risk, but it was very hard to articulate the benefits of going to web standards in a business-friendly way. Now, responsive web design, I think, had a similar version of this problem, but again, the risks were much higher for CSS because degrading gracefully was just not possible the way that it is now. We got past this. We did this one experiment at a time. We collaborated, we worked with other people, we learned from each other, we built on top of previous work. We had entered this time period where individuals could help shape the future of the web. We didn't see any browser evolution, but we still had to do our jobs. So what we did is we worked to evolve the state of the art with the tools that we had. We, as authors of websites, created new techniques. We did things that weren't possible previously, but unlike in the 90s, we were doing this in a way that was attempting to be accessible and semantic and as close to the spirit of the web as possible. Sometimes we had to make compromises. You know, we used the wrong technology to solve the right problem. Layout being a classic example of this. This was the first problem that we had to solve for CSS-based designs. Some people had to figure out how to build layouts in the first place. There were no controls, no mechanisms built into the language. We had two conceivable properties that we could use to do layouts. One of them was positioning, absolute and relative. That's off the table. You can't build layouts that way and expect them to be scalable and um, not fix pixel values. So we couldn't use positioning. The other way was floats. This is where we got float-based layouts from. Now floats for layouts are a hack. They were never meant for layouts. They were meant simply for placing an image within a site and wrapping text around it. That's what floats were designed to do. But because there were no other conceivable CSS properties, we had to use the float property and take that and run with it. Now, because the browsers hadn't designed their support for float to account for that, obviously this was the root of many, many cross-browser problems. But this was a time when some people had to figure out how to build these layouts in the first place. And we got sites like uh, Blue Robot here, or Glish, or Noodle Incident, and this is probably triggering some nostalgia for some of you. Um, they built these layouts and they put them online, and we could go download the starting point and use that for our own work. So as simple as it sounds, these were the CSS frameworks of that time period. Now thankfully, the state of CSS layout has changed quite dramatically in the last couple of years, so um, things are much better. Another thing that we were looking at to solve some of our problems were images and how we could combine and create new techniques based on images in creative ways. And there were quite a few of these tricks. A good example would be sliding doors. Um, little hard to historically understand why this was important. There was this very common and popular navigation pattern of tabs back in those days. We don't really do that anymore. But the tabs were simply being applied with flat background colors and borders. And, uh, they perpetuated this, this boxy look that um, was kind of the stereotype for CSS-based design. Well, sliding doors cleverly used two images that would uh, have a repeating section in the middle and you could place text within, within them and they would slide apart and back and forth and uh, provide coverage of that tab so that you could put text in of any length and 
have a much more visual tab system. Um, incidentally, this basic technique of having a couple of images that slide back and forth was also how we achieved rounded corners for a while before border radius came along. Another problem that we fixed with images was when you've got a couple of columns and you're floating them to create that layout, one is very small and one is very large, how do you actually get the background to be consistent between those two uh, and make the heights of them match? There's no mechanism within floats to allow you to have two columns of equal height. It's simply based on the content. We solve that by taking a single pixel high GIF and repeating it down the page. And within that GIF, we'd have the perceptual background for each one of those columns. And so it didn't actually matter what size the text was within each. Now, this is a trick that some of you are probably familiar with. Uh, it lasted for quite a while. And it's hard to forget that at one point in time, Dan Cederholm had to invent this trick. One of my personal favorites is image replacement. Uh, this is, I think, a shining example of how we built on earlier techniques. Our basic text styling within CSS was quite limited. Uh, we didn't have web fonts. We weren't able to use any sort of advanced typographic controls. We didn't really have any effects on it. So to get that, you had to use an image. Uh, but you couldn't, like if you were to apply that image to the web page as an image element, you couldn't control that with CSS. You couldn't change it based on context. So image replacement was a fundamental trick to create a more visual web that remained accessible and indexable. And it was quite fundamental for the CSS Zen Garden. I don't think this site would have worked if it weren't for image replacement. I'd made an earlier version of it a couple of months prior but it didn't have that same visual impact. People respond to visual ideas, and much like the early web, uh, standards-based design had to prove itself visually to get people excited about it. At the start of this time period, JavaScript was still a dirty word. Designers and often developers would go to heroic lengths to avoid building interfaces with it. Uh, sure, this was definitely a browser support issue, but I suspect that this is also due to a concept of DHTML, dynamic HTML. Um, this was kind of a hangover from the end of the, the 90s, uh, and it really caused this perception of JavaScript being evil for quite a while. It wasn't until the end of this time period that JavaScript started being taken seriously. It caught on right around the time of um, the term Ajax, when that was defined, and when that became popularized, JavaScript really started picking up. This was also a time of uh, a lot of independent services and companies starting to pop up near the end of this time period. These would be companies like Flickr and Delicious and FeedBurner and Upcoming. And all of these companies have this collective label that also goes along with gradients and shiny buttons and things. I, I refuse to acknowledge that term. But these companies came along at a time when interest in the web was getting revived. And what's cool about this is that I, I think that the... Um, the impact of these companies and what they were doing really revived the general interest and brought a lot of you know, today's popularity and um, the amount of work that we're doing on the web to hold. And there was one company that saw the potential in this and bought a lot of these independent companies on the cheap. That company was Yahoo. There was this brief period from about 2005 to 2007 where Yahoo was seen as a cool company that actually got the web and had a lot of interesting projects and people working for it. So after a long time, the web scene is valuable again. And maybe this is just correlation, but I think it's entirely possible that Yahoo kickstarted the current bubble that we're in today. Now, hindsight isn't so kind because it didn't end well for a lot of these companies. You know, lately, we're all too familiar with this pattern of a company getting acquired or aqua hired and the service getting shut down and uh, data being destroyed. Well, Yahoo did it first. So that brings us to the most recent era. And we don't have to spend a lot of time here because you're all living in it. So today there's just this incredible diversity in how we build for the web and how we think of it. And this is what we've been hearing throughout the rest of this conference. What should be clear is that the skills that we need today are just light years ahead of what we needed 10 or 15 years ago. A couple highlights. Uh, the web was designed to work on any device. I talked about that at the beginning. For most of the time prior to this, that was just a pipe dream. There weren't any other devices. Only desktop mattered. You know, maybe for conscientious developers, screen readers got a nod, but um, there were no mobile phones. And then when they were uh, essentially, when we got smartphones, uh, the web browsers on those smartphones were terrible, and nobody took them seriously, including their users. So for at least four years, between about 2004 to 2007, every year, people were asking, is this the year of mobile? Maybe it's this year. And it just kept not being true. 
and the browsers just kept being terrible until 2007. The iPhone was the first phone with a full desktop class browser, and it just changed overnight how everybody looked at the mobile web. It's obviously not the only phone with a good browser anymore, thankfully, but it was the first one that mattered. And kind of funny in hindsight was if you go back and you watch the keynote where Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone in the first place, he introduced it as three devices. He did this clever trick where you know, he got the audience pumped up about three devices and revealed it as one. And they were an, a phone, and the audience went nuts because that's what they were expecting. Finally, Apple's building a phone. An iPod, of course, the audience loved that because the iPod was a very popular brand at the time and an internet communicator. And there was polite applause. The audience didn't really know what to make of that one. And that's interesting, because what do you do with your phone these days? You're not talking on it. You're not listening to music on it nearly as much as you're using the internet. It seems like 2008 is when things really started accelerating for the open web. A lot of the stuff that we use now was being developed or uh, really starting to take hold during this time frame. CSS animation, web fonts, SVG, even HTML5. Um, 2008 was the year that Chrome was released, and uh, it was, I, I guess, a very busy year for Google because it was also the year that Android uh, and its first public version was released. I'd like to steal a slide from my friend Brad here. The web does not stop at phones anymore. The, phone, the form factors are continuing to diversify. Uh, we've had, had tablets and now watches, TVs, cars are even getting web browsers in them. The context of the web is changing considerably. You're not sitting at a desk anymore. Uh, you're now accessing the web with whichever device that you have handy and switching that context very frequently. So we need a set of tools. We need an ability to plan for uncertainty and present the web in the best possible scenario, regardless of the viewing environment. And so that's why responsive web design matters. Ethan wrote the article five years ago defining responsive web design. And to me, it's really funny what hindsight can tell us because there was this time where the idea of layout and how we built that was an argument. Some people, most people, were arguing for fixed width layouts, fix your design to a certain number of pixels because it was just much easier to develop your websites with CSS that way. It was still very hard, but it was a lot easier if you didn't have to account for variable uh, viewing environments. Whereas a very small amount of people, people like Ethan, people like Jeremy Keith, were arguing for fluid layouts and supporting the full width of the browser and being true to the spirit of the web. Of course, they were right, but it wasn't until responsive web design came along and gave us the technology and the, the ability to cater to all these different screen sizes that it really, that idea took hold. So a couple last thoughts. I'm a little over time. Um, right now, we're in a period where major vendors are committed to the web. Not only that, but they're the ones that are driving change. A lot of the standards are being moved forward by companies like Google and Apple and Microsoft, and they've got editors at the W3C proposing new specs and implementing them and sharing that openly with their competitors. Given the historical context, it really feels like the last five years have been in overdrive. It's really hard to stay on top of everything that's happening, and that's an amazing place to be. You know, We're no longer trying to push past a stagnant web. Now we have to... Uh, do everything we can to keep up with all of the new skills and all the new technologies. So it's important that we continuously develop our skills. You know, there's no end of specializations, but I would say that once you've picked your specialization, make sure that you're staying curious about the rest. If you're a designer, make sure that you're learning Django alongside Sketch. If you're a developer, keep your skills up to date, but maybe pick up a book on content strategy while you're at it. If you plan to make a career on the web, Continuous growth is the most important thing that you should expect your, from yourself because the web is going to continue to change. Don't get stuck in a rut and stop learning. The only thing that I can guarantee is that if you don't continue growing your skills, you're going to kill your long-term career prospects. Finally, and this is really important, seen from a viewpoint that reaches back 15 years, today really looks good. But I don't think we should let our guard down. There's still things that are threats to the open web as we know it. Network neutrality is a very, very big issue and always been talked about by governments and corporations alike. Government censorship itself is a growing concern. And if you live in a company where you think it can't happen here, well, so did I until my company, or my country, Canada, introduced legislation in the last couple of weeks that has gone down the road of what the UK has started. Um, the web, it needs to be open and free. And those two things alone can change all that. But they're not the only things. Where's our browser share going? A healthy ecosystem is diverse, and if you look at what the most 
popular desktop browser is and what the most popular mobile browsers are, one company is controlling those. Now, I don't think that we're ever gonna see the Internet Explorer 6 scenario play out again, but the fact that one company controls both of those, those browser ecosystems is, makes things a little hard to predict. So are these threats serious? Well, yeah. I mean, we have this global medium for the free open exchange of ideas. That's far too important for humanity as a species to let corporations and business interests slowly erode. Should we worry about the web's future? Well, the web has stared down gigantic existential threats in the past. It saw the collapse of the dot-com bubble. It saw browser stagnation. Both of those things could have taken it down. It came out on top. So history suggests that we can be cautiously optimistic, but there's no guarantee that it's going to happen every time. We need to fight to keep the web open and free, but the odds are in our favor. The web has shown time and again that it's resilient and able to route around damage, and so we should help it. If we take stock of the where, where the web is today, last year the web crossed the 1 billion website threshold, and the latest estimates are that over 3 billion people, or 40% of humanity, now have access, and those numbers are getting bigger every single day. The future, well, it's unclear, but that's not new. It's always been unclear. We've been through scary times in the past. We will go through more in the future. I love the web that we've ended up with. I want that same web for the rest of my life. I hope you do too. Let's all leave the room and do our part to build a future that we want. Thank you very much.